yes, next we have our featured speaker. Uh, she is an extra, like I said, extra galactic astrophysicist. That just makes me happy to say. <laughs> there, there is such a thing as an extra galactic astrophysicist. There is. Yeah. yeah. And I've talked to her. <laughs> I've met her. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of cool. Anyway, sorry. Um, she is at NASA Caltech in Pasadena. She studies the formation and evolution of galaxies over the universe's history. Swoon. Uh, she is also Macmillan Publishing's Everyday Einstein with a weekly podcast. Please welcome Dr. Sabrina Sierwalt. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Thanks for saying something because I can't see anything. Uh, so... Did you know that a little sprinkle of essential oil can cure everything from nausea to migraines to insomnia? Did you know that eating chocolate every day will make you smarter? Or do these things sound a little bit too good to be true? Now, a recent study out of MIT tracked false stories uh, on the internet. So they looked at over 100,000 stories on Twitter uh, and they tracked them over the last decade, and they found that fake news travels faster than reality. So the fake stories, the most viral runs, reach as many as 100,000 people, while we can change, does this work? Can we change my face? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, the most viral fake stories reach as much as 100,000 people, while the truth rarely made it to more than a thousand people. So why is that? Well, part of the problem is that fake stories are more easily entertaining. Reality tends to have more nuance, it's a little more complicated, and it has the limitation that it actually has to have happened. So I'm an astrophysicist working for NASA, and I spend part of my day asking questions about the universe and then trying to answer them. I spend the other part of my day working out ways to explain the science that we're learning from NASA's missions to the public. So I'm currently working on a video series called Could We Live There? about the habitability of exoplanets, planets around other stars that we're now finding by the thousands thanks to NASA's Kepler mission. But the truth is, the answer to could we live there, spoiler, is, at least for the foreseeable future, no, definitely not, <laughs> or, uh, I don't know, maybe? And it turns out, uh, maybe, is pretty unsatisfying. So I love science because it pokes at the unknown, but this makes some people very uncomfortable. It also can make science hard to report on. It would be a lot easier to pique people's interest if I could tell you, we found an Earth twin, and we're all ready. It's, it's perfect for us. Sorry, my daughter just came in. Uh, <laughs> honey, go get the kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, thanks, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it would be a lot easier if I could just say, we found an Earth twin, it's perfect for us. Or better yet, Pack your bags, we found a way out of this current political situation. We're going to Proxima B. Uh, but the truth is that the story of exoplanets is really fascinating. So we found the first planet orbiting another sun-like star in 1995. So that's less than 25 years ago. And we've since found another 4,000 exoplanets, and about 1,000 of these look to be terrestrial planets or rocky planets like Earth or Mars. So that's a lot of progress for 25 years. It took us a thousand years just to figure out that we were going around the sun and not the other way around. But we still have a ways to go in understanding the physical composition and the atmospheres of these planets before we can tell if they're suitable for life. So the story of exoplanets is a really interesting one, but it's a bit complicated to tell. And it's natural for journalists to want to wrap up in a neat and tidy conclusion. So what can we do as lovers of evidence-based science? 
when fake news is easier to write and it travels faster, how can we make sure that the real science stories are getting out? Well, the easiest thing we can do is to not pass on fake news. So raise your hand if you've ever shared an article without fully reading the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, we're all a little guilty of this. Uh, so assuming we've actually read the article, I'm willing to bet that most of us in this room are able to pick out science stories that are obviously false. So let's say anything that comes out of goop. <laughs> Glad you guys got that. Uh, so, but what about articles that are just a little bit exaggerated or just a bit off? Well, I told you what I do by day, but by night I'm also hosting a science podcast that covers topics other than astronomy. So this means I'm often investigating topics where I'm far from a subject matter expert, and it's really allowed me to hone my skills into finding, uh, it, differentiating between fake science stories and those that are a little bit exact, real science stories and those that are a little bit exaggerated or you know just a, a totally wrong. So I thought I'd share some of these tips that I've learned with you. If this works. Great. So since I am an astrophysicist, I do want to start with some stories from astronomy. In particular, this one that haunts me every year, <laughs> the supermoon. Now you see the moon goes around the Earth, not in a perfect circle, but in an ellipse. So this means that sometimes the moon is going to be closer to the Earth, and sometimes it's going to be farther away. Now the supermoon, or what astronomers actually call the perigean moon, occurs when the moon is at its closest orbital point, or perigee, and it's also while being a full moon. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with reporting about the existence of the supermoon, but less science-savvy sources tend to have headlines like this one, brace yourself, the supermoon is coming. Well, the supermoon actually comes three to four times a year. So did you brace yourself those times? Uh, and this suggests that it's a rare event when it's really not. And also, you're probably not gonna be able to tell. So the supermoon is actually 14% bigger in diameter than the smallest moon when the moon is farthest away at apogee. So that's a lot. If you look at this picture down here on the, in the corner, that looks like a big noticeable difference. But remember that from our perspective, the moon up in the sky is about the same size as your fingernail when you're holding it at arm's length. So we're talking about 14% of that. And the supermoon might be bigger by 14% than the smallest moon, but it's only about 8% bigger than the average full moon. And when it comes time for the supermoon, the last full moon you saw was a month ago. So you're gonna have to remember how big that moon was to within 8% in order to be able to see the difference in the supermoon, not likely. But don't despair. As is usually the case, there is a real story here that is actually far more interesting. Now, you may have actually seen the moon appear on the horizon, and it looked pretty large. I certainly have. And, but this isn't because you're seeing some sort of supermoon. And it's actually, we, we don't actually know the reason why the moon looks so big on the horizon. We, all we know is that it's not based in a physical reality, at least as not to the extent that you're seeing it, uh, but it's because our brain is playing a trick on us. How cool is that? So the best explanation we have for why the moon appears larger on the horizon is that it is something called a Ponzo illusion. So our brain sees objects, it knows objects on the horizon are more distant than objects in the foreground. So it compensates for that. So in other words, if you take two objects of the same size, like these two red lines, they're the same size, and you put one at the horizon, our brain tells us that one must be bigger. This guy totally doesn't believe me. <laughs> so it tells us, our, our brain tells us that the one on the horizon is actually bigger. So similarly, 
when the moon appears on the horizon, our brain tells us that it's actually larger than when it's overhead. So when you're looking at sources and you're reading about things like the supermoon, check those sources. Is, have you heard of this source before? It, has it published reliable results in the past? Is it a WordPress site that also promises to tell you your horoscope as read by a psychic cat? Or is it, say, National Geographic? So another example, another tip is to check the story behind the headline. So journalists don't always get to pick their headlines, and headlines are meant to grab our attention. So sometimes a sensationalist or exaggerated headline gets put on an article that's otherwise totally fine. A great example of this coverage is Tabby Star. So Tabby Star is a F3 star, so it's totally normal, run-of-the-mill star. Uh, but there's billions of times a sensationalist or exaggerated headline gets put on has these unexpected dips in its brightness that can't be explained simply by a planet going around it and occasionally blocking the light that we get from the star. So we've never, th these dips are not consistent with a planet because one, they're too irregular. Planets tend to have very consistent, predictable motions. And two, they're too big. Sometimes this star dims by as much as 22%, which is, there's no planets big enough to do that. So we've never seen anything like Tabby's star. And so astronomers at first couldn't explain these dips. The headline said we were baffled, bewildered, scrambling. Uh, and so, with the absence of a known explanation, obviously it must be an alien megastructure. <laughs> so, to be fair, it was an astronomer that first said that the dimming that we see from Tabby's star is consistent with what we would see if someone had built a big solid structure around the star. He said a lot of other things too, but somehow those didn't get picked up quite so readily by the press as the, his comment on aliens did. So some of these articles were totally scientifically accurate, they just got slapped with, slapped with headlines promising aliens. So further observation, oh, and I wanted to say there was one article that I loved that was called NASA's Quiet Disclosure. And it said that because NASA didn't make a big deal out of Tabby Star Discovery right away, we must be hiding something, that something being aliens. And I can tell you as someone whose job it is to promote the science that we're learning at NASA, <laughs> sometimes there's no sorted reason for the delay. We're just having a rough week. So future, m further observations of Tabby Star has revealed that these dips are brighter at bluer wavelengths than they are in the red. And this is classic dust behavior, not something you would expect from an alien megastar. So there's some sort of dusty material in between us and the star blocking its light. Uh, so this is where the fun, real fun begins. What is creating this dust? It could be an interstellar black hole. It could be a family of comets. It could be uh, planets that collided uh, and kicked up a bunch of debris. Of course, it could also be that new aliens came in and blew up the old alien megastructure, causing a ton of dust and debris to be spread everywhere. So another tip is to check that the source has actual citations uh, and check what those citations are. So uh, I can tell you that it's extra work to carefully cite your sources as a writer. So if you see a source that doesn't have citations, that's a huge red flag. But if you, and I know we don't have time to track back those citations until we get into an original journal article, but sometimes all it takes is a few clicks. So an example is I was once looking for a topic to cover for my podcast and I saw a flurry of articles all about the same thing, the best time of day to drink your coffee. And they had headlines like this, the best time to drink coffee according to science. And so all of these sources had suggested that neuroscientists had determined that you could maximize the boost in your productivity that you get from drinking coffee by timing your coffee consumption with lows in your endorphin levels. I was super pumped. So never has there been a finding more suited to my interests than when they started telling us that red wine is good for your health. 
But when I started tracking back where all this viral, the, the, the sources that were being cited in this viral content, they all pointed to a single source, a blog post by a graduate student in neuroscience, who by the way, studied in an entirely different field of neuroscience, suggesting that this might be something cool to look into for future research. <laughs> so it's not the grad student's fault. He's allowed to muse on his own personal blog, but rather all of these news outlets that turned it into something that it wasn't. So another example of source citation gone wrong uh, is a study, a more recent viral study, that chocolate is on track to go extinct in the next 40 years. Yeah. Now, for, thanks to climate change. So now, 40 years would put this within my lifetime, and you guys, chocolate cannot go extinct until I'm allowed to be an old lady and sit on my porch and eat cake all day with impunity. So all of these sources, again, though, trace back to a single source, which is which was a post on a certain business, uh, uh, well, on a news, uh, you can't see it, on a news aggregator, Business Insider. So this Business Insider post that was the catalyst for all this viral content did cite a reliable source. It cited a summary by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which was a summary of a report put out by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But the thing is, if you just did one more click back to the NOAA page, even though their summary and the initial report suggested that rising global temperatures might be a problem or, quote, less suitable for plants like cacao that give us chocolate, it's not, neither threatened extinction. And there were actually really cool facts in that original report about the sustainability of chocolate that didn't get covered at all. For example, scientists are looking into gene editing techniques to directly edit the DNA of crops like cacao to make them more adaptable to climate change. Now, a last example of the importance of tracking your sources is this recent mass concern that their scientists found fecal bacteria in men's beards. So, Titles included, men's beards are full of poo and nasty bacteria, your beard is as dirty as a toilet, and bearded men have poop on their faces. <laughs> now, I know, I'm confused too, right? How can such a handsome man be covered in poop? <laughs> so these sources all say that a swabbing analysis was done on a sample of beards and sent to a microbiologist for study. Sounds like a reasonable setup. Except this swabbing analysis was done by a local TV station. So not in a lab, not for any peer reviewed study. And the, hand, the sample of beards was just a handful of random volunteers. Now beyond the problems with this experimental setup, uh, this result is already a major red flag. And that's because I have some bad news for you. Beard or no beard, you are covered in poo bacteria. Look to the person on your left. They are also covered in poo bacteria. Your cell phone, the ATM, uh, the gas pump, probably the door handle on the way in here, covered in poo bacteria. The more interesting and more accurate story here is that there are an estimated 10 to the 30th power different types of bacteria on this planet. That's one with 30 zeros after it. Uh, and we've only sequenced about 80,000 of them. And even of those 80,000, we don't know all of their functions. So just because a bacteria likes to hang out in feces, doesn't mean that same bacteria doesn't also like to hang out somewhere else, like our skin. So you can have poo bacteria on your face without the poo. <laughs> so warning us that men's beards have fecal bacteria in them is kind of like the food babe telling us to stay away from all chemicals. So since I think I can't top poo beards or alien megastructures, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, so, when you're checking a source, check, uh, when you're checking an article, check the source, check the citations, check that the title matches the text, 
and look for otherwise uh, over-exaggerated information. And if you're still not sure about a source, look around to see if anyone else is covering the story. Can you find it elsewhere at a source that you trust? And there are also several sites like these that are dedicated to tracking down the validity of news stories that go viral. So there's a chance that someone else has already done the work for you. Now, I've kept it pretty light today, chocolate, aliens, poo beard, <laughs> but we know that there are some issues uh, where false or misleading scientific content can lead to more serious consequences, like with vaccines. Access to real, fact-driven information is too important to take for granted. Plus, there is so much cool science out there to learn, we don't have to make it up. Thank you. <laughs>